Hi, in this video we're going to be talking about Sphero coding. We're going to talk about how codes work and some basics when it comes to uh, coding and doing some kind of simple programming for bolts. But first though we want to talk just a little bit about how the Sphero bolt robots work. When you think about it, really the instructions for how the robot is, is going to work and the actions it's going to do are going to come from a mobile device most often, but also could come from a Mac or Windows laptop, really anything that has a Bluetooth device or a Bluetooth connection rather. On that device, you're going to stack things called blocks if you're doing block coding. This is a block right here, a spin block. This is a block right here that controls the color of the main LED. And so this really short program right here is telling the bolt to spin all the way around 360 degrees in two seconds. And then after that's complete, um, make its main LED green, which would be this part right here. Make that green. The connection to the robot is mediated through a Bluetooth connection. So there's Bluetooth signals with the commands to the robot are sent. And the robot performs the actions and uh, simultaneously is sending information back to the mobile device uh, from its sensors, things uh, including uh, its accelerometer, gyroscope, um, and then some information about how its, its motors are moving. And this happens 20 times per second. Gives you a sense of how much communication is going on between the device and the robot. So that's just very basically um, how the robot works. It works on commands that are kind of distributed to it over Bluetooth uh, from another device. So when we think about uh, how to control the uh, robot, we have to start thinking about orientation because it's a spherical robot, so we have to know like which way is it pointing. And it's not always super clear. So the first thing that you do when you start um, working with a bolt and if you want to set it up to do a program is you need to get the orientation set up. And so there's something that you'll find in the Sphero EDU app that's uh, called kind of the aim button. And when you press that, what you're going to get is a blue tail light, as they call it, that's going to appear. And uh, you want to orient that in such a way that it's facing you. All right. Uh, if you see an actual picture of a Sphero bolt doing this, um, it has this really bright um, blue LED and you want to try to orient it so that's pointing at you. So this one right here is correctly uh, oriented right now. If you do that, now in the programming when you use a heading block, um, you have a good indication of all the angles um, that that bolt can be pointed. So if you point it at zero degrees, you can see right here it's pointing away from you. If you have it pointed at 90 degrees, it's pointed uh, to your right, it'll go right. Uh, 270 degrees, it's going to go left. And if it's at 180, it's going to come towards you. That is if you set it up correctly um, at the get-go. And so you can program in using this heading block right here, uh, any heading in all 360 degrees that you want that robot to travel. So that's kind of option one for orientation. Option two involves the magnetometer, uh, and the magnetometer in electronics is just fancy for saying that this thing has a compass on board. So it can judge, as long as there's no other strong magnetic field around, um, it can actually judge uh, and figure out which way is north uh, based on the Earth's magnetic field and its own onboard magnetometer. If you use this in your programming, you definitely want to calibrate the compass first, and that will give the uh, bolt a chance to actually figure out which way is north. And then from there, you can use this block, compass direction, which will use north as zero. And you can use compass directions to tell your robot to go different ways. This would be helpful if you're in a place where um, those uh, cardinal directions are relevant, more so than just kind of the way that you're facing to start with. And so again, like east then is your 90 degrees, south is the 180 degrees, and so on. West is your 270. So that gives you two different ways to orient. You can either orient it um, as away from you being zero degrees, or you can use uh, the compass. I found the compass to be pretty unreliable indoors just because there's other magnetic fields uh, around. But um, if you're outside or, you've, or you find it to be helpful, it is a possibility. 
So then we got to talk about speed. Speed's a little bit weird for um, the, the bolt because it doesn't really tell you what the unit is uh, and you can pick anything from zero to 255. So I found uh, and tested this and found a useful kind of conversion rate that um, if you're looking at Sphero speed as they define it, because they have this handy block here for speed, if your Sphero speed equals 100, that is roughly equal to 40 centimeters per second. All right, and that kind of gives you an indication of uh, a factor that you can use, a conversion factor that you can use when you're picking the speed of your bolt, because again, the speed that you put into uh, the, the block here is not uh, any kind of special unit other than being sphero speed, but this is your conversion factor here to centimeters per second. So if you're doing anything that you need to go a certain distance and need to make those calculations, this can be extraordinarily helpful right here. You have an option when you're deciding to uh, figure out how your bolt is going to move to either put all of the instructions kind of in one block, like in the roll block that I have right here, or you can list them separately. So my example right here is I'm, I'm showing the same thing. This is actually the same thing right here, um, but one is with one block and one uses four. So it tells it it's going to go 20 degrees, which is like you know, to uh, ahead of you and slightly to the right, uh, it's going to go at 104 sphero speed, so a little over 40 centimeters per second. And it's going to do that for five seconds before stopping, and that's all incorporated into this single block right here. You can also tell it the same thing, but use separate blocks. So I can tell it its heading. So the first thing it would do is it would turn to that heading of 20 degrees. Then it'll start moving at this speed of 104, which is identical to what it is in the roll. And then I have a delay uh, control built in here. That just means it's gonna keep on doing these things for five seconds. And then after those five seconds, I have a stop command right here, a stop block. And that just tells the Sphero bolt to stop. So this over here is the exact same thing as this right here it's just written out in a different way using the the flexible block coding there's other movement blocks too there's something called raw motor i don't use it very often but um, it's important to understand that on the bolt there are two motors and if you turn it on it's uh, upside down you can see it right there there's a motor on this side and a motor on this side right here and so if you want to you can just tell the bolt i want you to uh, move your motor at such and such speed uh, for a certain amount of seconds and that'll result in some kind of uh, movement um, even if it's a little uh, maybe a little less predictable in terms of exactly where it's going to go so also, also something to keep in mind here is that um, the stabilization feature so the video that I'm showing right here shows the stabilization on and you can see the gyroscopes that are actually in the bolt keep that blue light uh, kind of facing up this down here I have another example and this one um, it's not on and you can see the bolt doesn't take any kind of corrective action to try to keep the red LED facing up it uh, basically just stays where it's at so having stabilization on uses the gyroscopes to maintain an orientation of up and down and having your like your LED facing up and if you turn this off which you can turn it off results in what we saw here where it, it doesn't do that um, there's three different lights uh, really on your on your spheral bolts um, I wrote this really tiny little program here just to demonstrate and show what you have access to the front LED you can see right here points to that one you can control the the brightness of that you can also control its color when it's talking about the main LED, that one for me is probably the most confusing because it's not just one LED, it's a whole matrix of LEDs, but they call it the main LED. And so you can control the brightness and the color of that one. And then it also has a back LED. And so you can control that with those separate blocks. So pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just important to remember that when they're talking about the main LED, they're not talking about just one, they're talking about that whole matrix of LEDs. So there are some other LED options that you can do to control the lights uh, and display different things on top of the matrix, specifically what we see right here. Um, and I have a, a video right here on the right hand side of this slide that will go through each of these, the matrix animation, 
allows you to like make your own animation um, by making pictures and having them show up for a certain amount of time. You can show just one character at a time uh, if you want. You can input some scrolling text and actually control how fast that text scrolls across the screen as well as looking at the color. You can have just one pixel, uh, just one individual pixel show up on your bolt, or you can have a whole line of pixels show up somewhere in the matrix. So we're going to go through and see the different pieces of this. So here we have the animation, the single matrix character of M. Are we didn't start the fire one? And it looks like the matrix pixel and the line were some, for some reason cut off on that. So you also have some sound options. Um, what's a little bit strange about the way that bolts work is where the sound actually comes from. So when you uh, create a program like the one that I did here, where I'm, I'm telling the bolt to speak something, uh, the phone does the talking. When I press start and actually run this program, rather than the bolt, the bolt is not actually going to do this because the bolt is incapable of making noises. It doesn't have a speaker on it. So when you actually uh, run this program, it's going to come out of your iPhone or other device uh, speakers. So it's important to uh, make sure your volume on the device is on because if you have it turned really quiet or you have you know the sound muted on your phone uh, or other device that you're using it's it's not actually you're not going to be able to hear the sounds that you're trying to use in your programs um, but just a little bit of a weird thing uh, something to keep in mind you can uh, have your bolt in your bolt programs you can have effect sounds there's a whole long list of effect sounds i know it says random right here um, but there's all sorts of options uh, so you click that and you can see all sorts of options alternatively um, you can actually just type in what you wanted to say actually the device speaks and the device means the mobile device when we get a little bit more advanced there's other things that we can put in there so that we can have your bolt report things like how hard did it hit the ground when it dropped something like that um, so there are other options that are maybe a little bit more practical that you can use this uh, sound options for. And then, of course, also spoken words, like I just said. So here's where things get actually kind of fun. Um, there's things called loops that you can use and um, also delays. We should note that uh, delays are very, very important. Um, because your bolt communicates with a device only a certain number of times per second, I found that delays, putting delays between um, actions that you want your bolt to do can actually help everything run smoother. So uh, I use um, these uh, between kind of actions. So if I want the robot to you know, go a certain speed for a certain amount of time and then turn around, I'll put a delay in between uh, so that it has just time to kind of reorient itself and uh, doesn't uh, miss things. Because sometimes I find that if I don't put delays in, some things are just missed. They, they don't actually get executed. The, pro the um, program blocks don't get executed. But the, the focus of this uh, slide is about loops. And loops are uh, pieces of code that are repeated a number of times. Um, so they repeat a set of actions. So what you can do is you can loop something. So if I want you know, it to say hi five times, I would go in here and change this to five. And then I could put a speak block in here. And I could put hi. And then what would happen, the robot would say hi once, and then it would go back to the top, and it would do it again, and then it would go back to the top and do it again, you know, in a loop, five times, one, two, three, four, five. It would go through that five times. You can also set up for it to loop forever. So you could have your robot saying hi forever and never stop until you turn the program off. You can also have it loop until something is true or something is false. And this is kind of more advanced and we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Um, but for right now, the two ones that we're going to deal with are looping a number of times or um, looping forever. 
and we can put rules with these that's kind of what this is about you can attach rules to your loops so they end after um, a certain you know uh, criteria is reached so to give you an example of what you can do with loops um, this is a gif of a spheral bolt doing a looping program and you can see right here that um, this is my my code for it so I have this thing that says loop forever you can see it's right here loop forever and I have it in here that first I want it to show the main LED as red I want it to delay for a second so waiting for a second then change it to blue then wait for another second change it to green wait for another second and at that point it loops right back to here, here where it changes it to red and it just goes on forever until I turn the program off so that's kind of the way that a loop works and this is a very simple loop but it gives you an idea of what the coding looks like for a loop here's another example for a loop so I just want you to take a look at this look that over for a second and so based on what we've talked about so far what should this robot do and so if you said it should make squares you're right <laughs> because what I'm telling it to do here is I'm telling it to at whatever orientation it's at I want it to go at a speed of 50 so that's like 20 centimeters per second uh, I want to let it do that for two seconds and after two seconds I want it to stop then I want it to turn 90 degrees take two seconds to turn 90 degrees and then I want it to delay for one second and then I want it to repeat that process and if you did that if you can just draw it out it looks like this so we have our bolt start here it goes 50 for two seconds it stops it's going to rotate 90 degrees okay rotates 90 degrees and then it does the same thing it goes 50 a speed of 50 for two seconds and it stops here it turns another 90 degrees does it for two seconds stops here turns another 90 degrees and continues that process forever until I turn it off so it just basically goes around making squares and so that's another kind of example of the way that you can use a loop to make your robot do something and they get a lot more advanced than this but this is just some uh, two kind of um, pretty simple examples so another really fun thing that we can do with um, the bolts is and all coding is stuff called if else coding or if then statements they're ca oftentimes called and they're called sometimes algorithmic thinking decision trees logic trees and we as people do use these all the time uh, even when we don't think about it so an example would be as a teacher uh, you might be taking attendance and uh, you say to yourself you know um, I have at least one student missing if this is true there are a number of actions that you're going to take based on that you're going to contact the office you're going to maybe send an email to a parent you're going to get the the papers and maybe send them home with a sibling if there's a sibling in the building um, those are all the actions you're going to take because this statement right here I have at least one student missing was true on the other hand if it's false you're going to do something else entirely you're going to take other actions you're just going to start your lesson on erosion and it's going to be it's going to be cool so if then thinking algorithmic thinking logic trees decision trees these are things that we do internally just all the time but what's cool is that we can program a robot to do the same thing kind of kind of make those decisions based on criteria that we set so there's two types of if else coding um, that we we can do with the Sphero one says just basically it says if something is true do this and this we don't know what that is it could be something like turn on a LED or say something or whatever it doesn't matter and then if this happened not to be true so if this wasn't true just just continue the code because of course we know that the way that the code works is it does this thing and then it goes down and looks for the next thing and it does them just like in a list on the other hand here we have this if else we can have if this is true do this 
but if else, so basically if it happened to be false, do this other thing. And so after it does that other thing, then it would kind of continue on and run more code down here. So those are the two types that we have available to us with the bolts. Before we can really talk much more about that if, if then statements or if else coding, we have to go take a step backwards and talk about a couple other things. One of them is operators and operators are basically just like math. Um, you have, you know, two numerical type values here, and then we can do something to it. You can, you can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, you can divide, you can take an exponent, you can take a percentage. So that's kind of a basic one there. You can also do more advanced. These would be like the advanced ones. You can take a square root, you can round, you can do a minimum or maximum. You could take the absolute value or something or find the sign. And then you can, speaking of sine, you can do uh, trigonomic tr trigonometry type stuff here with sine, cosine, tangent, um, et cetera. Not oftentimes used, but used sometimes. And then you can also um, get random numbers. This is the one that I use the most here, uh, that you can tell it that I want a random number integer, so a whole number here, from, and then you get to set your base, the minimum it can be, and the maximum it can be. And then a float, in a float, the only thing that's different is that it allows decimals. One of the cool things you can do with operators is something called nesting. And uh, nesting happens where you put um, one block within another block. So if you wanted to express something, you had an equation like three times in parentheses 17 minus six, you can do that using operators on the sphero bolt. So this shows how you do it. So first I'm gonna take three, uh, I'm gonna change the operator to times, and then I'm gonna actually drag um, a second operator in there, a basic one, and then take 17, change it to minus, and put six. And so that represents right there um, this equation that you see right up here. So that's nested. Another way to do it, another thing that you can do there, is I could take a random number between one and 10 minus a random, another random number between one and 10. And so the way that I do that is like this. So I start out with just a basic operator. I pull in one random integer. I set it to be between one and 10. And then I duplicate it. And then I drag this part over and put it right in there. And then I set, hit subtract. So that allows us to uh, actually be able to uh, take a random number minus another random number. So then one last piece that we need before we can kind of put it all together is something called a comparator. And the comparators um, allow you to, as the kind of root of the word suggests, compare things to determine what is true. So if we want to use uh, if then statements or if else coding, we need to establish something as being true or not, something that can be evaluated. And so in order to do that, we need a comparator. And so um, these are set up where you have two kind of numericals on either side and then something in the middle that uh, helps us define like what we're talking about. So this would be, this one means equal to, this one here means not equal to, and then of course you have the less than, less than or equal, greater, than and uh, greater or equal. So you can set them up that way. And then you can also set up, this is a compound comparator. So it could set up uh, basically like two of these could like go into these ones over here. So this means that thing one and thing two are true. This next one down here means or. So it could mean that thing one is true or thing two is true.
and that would return a true. These ones here on the bottom, I don't use very often for that, so um, they're a little more advanced. I'm going to skip over that for now. So let's take a coding example here to see how the operators, the comparators, and that if-then coding kind of all comes together, because without all three, it's kind of hard to see how they're useful. So let's imagine that we want to set up a program that basically turns our Sphero Bolt into a coin flipper. Okay, so that's, that's our goal. We want to turn it into a coin flipper. So we're going to start out with this controls. This right here is something that we're not talking about today, um, but it is an event. And what this means is that uh, we can set up the bolt to execute some blocks when a certain thing happens. So in this case, it's when it lands. So it's like throwing a coin in the air. When it lands in your hand, it's going to execute this. So that's just a little um, something that we need in order to make this work. So we, we start out with the control. Then we're going to need operators. And so just like a coin can randomly come up as heads or tails, we're going to use this random operator with an integer giving us, it's going to give us either a one or a two. All right. So it's going to give us one of those or the other, and we can use those, the one and the two to represent heads or tails. Then we're going to need the comparator. So we're going to see if this random number is equal to whatever it is um, we want to set up. So let's see how it all comes together. So the first thing we do right here, I set it so that random integer one or two, if it ends up being a one, I'm saying that it's heads and I'm going to speak heads or have it speak heads. And then if it's uh, not a one, then I'm saying it's tails. So that would be a two. So just to break that down again, notice here on start of program, nothing happens. However, when I throw the bolt in the air and catch it, it senses that it is landing. So caught from a throw, from a toss. And at that point, I have this if then or if else code block execute. And so what it's going to do is the bolt is going to create a random number, either a one or a two, right? Because there's only two choices of integers between one and two. And I'm saying if, if this random number equals, because remember this means equals, just one S and equals, if it equals one, then so there's a 50-50 chance that it's going to equal one. Then I'm going to have that bolt show the matrix character H for heads in the color of red. And then I'm going to actually have it speak. Of course, it's the phone heads and then wait. So it doesn't do anything after that. If the random integer is not equal. So if this is not true. So basically, if it picks a two instead of one, not equal to one. Then it skips over this part and doesn't do it and then comes down and does this instead. That's where the else comes in. Now it's going to show the matrix character T in the color blue and it's going to say tails. And this actually works. It's pretty fun. This is what happened when I caught it and it said heads. And this is what it did when it said tails. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of insight into the basics of uh, Sphero Bolt coding and also gives you a sense of how these different um, code blocks come together to make useful programs um, that, and again, these are just very, very simple ones. The ones that you generate uh, will probably get a lot more complicated than this, but this is a good place to start.